Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. Well, today we're turning to 1 Samuel chapter 13. You'll remember that we are in the early stages of Israel's transition from judges to kings. Yesterday, Samuel anointed Saul as the first king of Israel, and in real time, that's roughly seven days ago. But here we are in chapter 13. We just read chapter 10 yesterday, but we're going to be seeing how Saul's reign unfolds, and we're going to be looking at his character and how his character ultimately affects his reign. So let's go into this passage here. Verse 1 starts out with a basic recap of Saul's reign as king. And if you look at your version, especially in the side margin, you might see that there are some questions about these numbers. So that's because in ancient biblical Hebrew, they didn't have like numbers. Like we had like a number seven and it's like a seven. They would spell it on out and they would just have words that would be seven, words would be five or thousand. And so for instance, in this passage here, your version might say 30,000 chariots in verse six or 3,000 chariots. Uh, the word thousand could be a, a military unit. So in a way, we're not entirely sure. Is this 30 units or 30,000? Is this six units or 6,000? Uh, we don't really know. So we just kind of put the numbers we think are best and just make a note in the side margin. So we need to keep that in mind as we work through the numbers in First and Second Samuel. Well, verse 2 gives us a sense of, of Saul's army. Verse 3, Saul's son Jonathan goes and raids the Philistine garrison. And we might read that and kind of miss what's really going on here. Because what is a garrison? A garrison is like a military outpost. And that is showing us here the presence of the Philistines and, and really their overwhelming power. This garrison is established here in Geba. Geba is north of Jerusalem. It's kind of along the crossroads of two major roads in that region. And it's a fortress. It would be like having an enemy base just a few miles from your home. We often think about Israel being occupied by Rome in the days of Christ. Here we're saying that's basically occupied by the Philistines. They were this massive force in that day. Not only that, they were vastly superior when it came to their military technology. If you glance over at verse 19, you'll see that these occupying Philistines wouldn't even allow the Jewish people to have blacksmiths. Therefore, the Jewish people had no swords. They, they couldn't even like sharpen an axe. They were just completely beholden to the Philistines for pretty much all of their farm equipment, any sword, anything like that. And so this little note about the Philistine garrison here in Geba, well, that's really just the tip of the iceberg because the Philistines are this occupying force. They're incredibly dominant over the Israelis and just the, the, the Jewish folks hated it. And so they're really hoping that Saul can deal with these Philistines. And so here we are in the opening verses of chapter 13. Jonathan goes and attacks this garrison in Geba. That, of course, really ticks them off. And so in retaliation, the Philistines assemble their army to fight with Israel. Now again, for the, the Philistines to have a garrison, that's talking about like an actual army. That's talking about trained soldiers. That's talking about uh, leadership, training. That's talking about supplies, cooks that help prepare the food for everybody. And so you've got this whole army now assembling. And, it's, and the, the numbers we have in the New American Standard say it's 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and so many soldiers, it's like the sand of the sea. And so in verse 6, the people are just see this overwhelming force coming down upon them, and they're terrified. And so some run here, some run there, they, they hide in caves. Some go all the way back across the Jordan. Remember to that other side of the Jordan where, where there, there were some, still some Jewish brethren on the east side? This is a very serious situation. And so you have Saul. He's this brand new king. He's just basically going out to his first battle with the Philistines. Everyone is hoping he's going to throw off these occupiers. And he goes there, and like Samuel had said, he waits seven days. Well, sort of, because it looks as though Saul waited seven days, but there was no sign of Samuel, and, and things are getting really serious. In fact, look at the size of the army Saul has in verse 2. It says he's got about 3,000 men. Now glance to verse 15, where the, the size of the army Saul had after this whole event transpires. It's only 600 men. That's a huge loss. And so Saul is seeing all these soldiers leaving him. He's got this massive army standing against him, and he starts to panic. And so on the seventh day, he's been waiting now for Samuel for all this time. Samuel still doesn't show on up. And maybe it was during the morning sacrifice when it was supposed to be offered. He takes matters into his own hands, and he just begins to offer the sacrifices. Now, all this might seem like a good thing. I mean, after all, Saul is demonstrating worship, right? No, unfortunately, he's not. You see, ultimately, worship is a reflection of our heart obedience to the Lord. It's not really about sacrifice. It's the sacrifices are representing what's in our hearts. 
Tomorrow we're going to read how Samuel tells Saul in 1 Samuel 15, 22, that to obey is better than sacrifice. And so Saul's disobedience here demonstrates he's not really worshiping God. He's seeking to curry God's favor, maybe. Uh, maybe to, to tell the people, hey, look, we're, we're doing the religious thing after all. This isn't really worship. This isn't really coming before God saying, okay, this is for your name and for your glory. We want to walk rightly with you and have you go before us. None of that's going on. This is basically rabbit's foot theology, trying to get God on his side so that he can win the battle and look good in front of everybody and, and just be this, this king that he's supposed to be. And so Saul here is revealing that he does not really have the proper heart as a leader of God's people. So this isn't a great scene. And along with that, you also know from studying God's word that God's never happy with people just making up their own forms of worship. Remember Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, back in Leviticus 10? Remember Korah's rebellion in Numbers 16? Those were not good situations, and in both situations, those people were killed. So no wonder that Samuel comes and arrives on the scene and tells Saul in verse 13, You have acted foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. And so, just as we've been seeing throughout our time in God's Word together, God takes the obedience of his leaders very seriously. They are often held to a higher account, a far higher account than maybe the people around them, and therefore they incur a far greater judgment as well for their disobedience. And so, in this situation, Samuel lets Saul know he's going to lose the kingdom. Samuel then tells Saul something that many of us have heard before, but we may not have realized comes from the verse here. We often say that David was a man after God's own heart. This is where that phrase comes from. Samuel says of Saul in verse 14, But now your kingdom shall not endure. The Lord has sought out for himself a man after his own heart, and the Lord has appointed him as ruler over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Now, if we know how the story unfolds, we know that this speaks of David. So we don't know how this news struck Saul but I would have been personally devastated to hear that I had disappointed God so much. Perhaps Saul was so concerned he couldn't even say anything, or maybe Saul was so indifferent he really just didn't seem to care. Either way, we don't really have a record of what happened other than Samuel heads out and Saul gathers the forces. It says that the Philistines send out raiders to destroy the Jews. And again, verse 19 tells us just how dire the situation is. As we mentioned, The Jewish people don't have any blacksmiths. They don't have any way of making swords. And yet they're going against this huge Philistine army with with numbers that are basically unable to be counted. And yet in verse 15, Saul's army is presently now just dwindled down to 600 people. And none of them have swords except for Saul and Jonathan. And so this situation is incredibly dire. Now our reading schedule is going to skip over what happens with this battle. But if you glance over to chapter 14, I can just show you kind of what happens in a couple key verses. In chapter 14, Saul's son named Jonathan goes with an armor bearer to take on the Philistine army. Incredibly brave and godly man. And you can see this by even just how he refers to the Lord in verse 6. Look at the end of verse 6. He says, For the Lord is not restrained to save by many or by few. Jonathan just has this incredible faith and rich trust in the Lord. Remember, Saul is viewing God like kind of like a rabbit's foot. Like maybe God will just help me improve the battle a little bit. We can do better with God. We got to keep my troops. I need like 3,000, but God will help us. If we have the rabbit's foot with us, God will help us win the battle. Jonathan's like, God doesn't need 3,000. He just needs one or two faithful dudes just going to go on up and take the battle for his name. And so Jonathan is putting all of his eggs in this basket. So he takes he and his armor bearer and they go and they attack this entire massive army of Philistines. Well, you might imagine how that would go, or maybe not, because what happens is pretty surprising. When Jonathan and his armor bearer go and attack the Philistines in verse 14 of chapter 14, they take out 20 enemy soldiers. Now that's a, a respectable number, but that's hardly a defeat of an entire army. But then verse 15 shows us that the Lord fights for Jonathan and a massive earthquake starts on up. And in verse 22, the Philistines flee all over. The, they just, they run terrified. And so the Lord fought for the Jews that day. Now, that was a great victory. But here we are in chapter 13, and we're seeing Saul's disobedience to the Lord. His son was a great guy, and his son would have been a better king than his father. But his son would not be king because God had taken the kingdom from Saul. And so, just a couple points of application here. For one thing, we're seeing the principle of waiting. The Bible often talks about how important it is for us to wait and trust in the Lord. 
often we will give God like a little window to work. You know, okay, I'm willing to give God a shot. We open things on up. We say, okay, God, do your thing. But if he doesn't work in our time frame, we'll often take back the reins. And we often sin out of expediency. We'll look at our situation and we'll say, well, you know what? I had no other choice. Given the situation I was in, I had no other choice but to sin. And we're seeing here that living in fellowship with God and living in obedience to God is learning to never resort to those steps, to never pull the reins back from God, but just to obey him and let him rule and lead and we submit and surrender to him. We're also seeing here the difference between superstition and devotion. Superstition seeks to barter with God or or just some kind of conjuring of spiritual forces to get God to bless us. True devotion seeks to worship him and walk with him and obey him and align with him so that his name is glorified and his will is done. When we come to God and we try to barter with him to bless us, we're still basically our own little G God. We're still most the most important to us. We just want God to help us be a better version of us because we're still our own God. But the entire message of scripture is it's not about currying favor with God. It's about being reconciled to a holy and righteous God who is calling us out of this world to be part of his kingdom. This is supposed to be the kingdom of God's people here. And if Saul himself as the king can't even walk according to the the tenets of the Lord, well, he's going to lead this entire kingdom astray. And so Saul has to go. God won't allow a king or his lineage to continually lead his people astray. And that's why he's going to a new king. He's going to bring David on in who's going to walk with him and obey him. And that leads us to our last takeaway. David is a man who is after God's own heart, but not Saul. Saul was a man after his own heart for himself. He wanted to look good. He wanted to be esteemed by the people. He wanted personal success. Saul wanted many things, but what he did not want was God to be pleased with him and God to be worshipped and glorified by him. And so Saul has to go and be replaced with a man who is after God's own heart. What's it mean to be a man for God's own heart? Well, when I think about it, I think it's about someone who wants to please God. It's someone who looks at their own life from God's perspective and just wants to be sure it's pleasing to him and and honoring to him. It's a person who wants God's name to be magnified and glorified. It's a person who wants God's will to be done. And it's a person who does all of this because they rejoice in having fellowship with God and they are grieved when that fellowship is broken. So many people claim to be Christians or go to church, but when they don't have fellowship with God or when they break their fellowship with God by their disobedience, they don't really care. And if they're confronted with it, kind of like with Saul here again, we don't know what Saul, how he responded, but he seems to kind of just like, yeah, I don't care. No big deal. Didn't really have great fellowship with God anyway. That's not a man after God's own heart. And so as we wrap up our time together today, how about spending some time with the Lord just where you submit yourself to him and you ask him to purify your heart and your motives so that you're about him and his glory. That's where you and I are going to find our greatest joy in this world and for all eternity. With that, we'll leave it there. Hope you have a great rest of your day. God bless.